Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this International Affairs webinar. As you know, International Affairs is Chatham House's journal, so a big welcome to our Chatham House members here today and also our readers from International Affairs. My name is Julia Cronoyer. I am a research assistant in the International Security Program here at Chatham House, and the International Affairs team has kindly asked me to chair today's panel. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you to the International Affairs team, and in particular, Isabel, for putting together this brilliant panel today. So our panelists today are authors from a special section in the July edition of International Affairs on feminist interrogations of global nuclear politics. And in today's event, we're going to be looking more closely at what both feminist IR and post-colonial IR can bring to this discussion to allow for a more substantive and innovative understanding of both nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. So this special section argues for a revitalization of these interrogations into the nuclear order to take into account other matrices and structures of power at play. So not only gender and race and colonialism, but also taking into account um, other factors that might have been historically ignored. For example, the voice of experiences and research of indigenous groups and those from the global south. So to kick things off, I'm actually going to take a quote from Catherine Eshley's article, and she's here on our panel today, and Shine Choi also, who both guest edited this special section, because I think it sets the tone quite nicely for what we're about to talk about. But this section begins the process of decentering the 1980s white Western experiences of the global nuclear order in feminist IR. So without further ado, I'm joined today by four brilliant international affairs authors from this section, who will be talking through their research in this area and the case studies that they've looked at. So first, I'd like to welcome Anne Runyon, professor in the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Cincinnati. Her article is entitled Indigenous Women's Resistances at the Start and End of the Nuclear Fuel Chain. Welcome. Um, I'd also like to welcome Lorraine Bayard de Volo, Professor of Women and Gender Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. And her article looks at masculinity and the Cuban Missile Crisis, gender as a preemptive deterrent. Thank you for being here today, Lorraine. I'd also like to welcome Catherine Ashley, Senior Lecturer at the University of Strathclyde, and as I mentioned before, also guest editor of this special section. And her article, co-authored with Shine Choi, is called Rethinking Global Nuclear Politics, Rethinking Feminism. And I'd also like to welcome Anand Srikumar. He is pursuing an MPhil in Diplomacy and Disarmament at the Center for International Politics, Organization, and Disarmament within the School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And his article is Feminism and Gandhi, Imagining Alternatives Beyond Indian Nuclearism. So thank you all so much for being here today. Before I hand over to the panel, I'll just run through a few housekeeping notes that we have. So today's event is on the record and it's being recorded. Um, and the structure of today's event is such that I will ask each of our speakers to make short introductory remarks, and then we'll go into a Q&A section. Um, and we're hoping to answer as many of your questions as possible. And you can use the Q&A function, which is a button at the bottom of your screen. We won't be using the chat function today. So you can pop your questions in there and we'll get to them in the Q&A section. Um, so, and we'll hopefully get to as many as we can. Um, but I'll now move to our speakers to introduce their research and findings. And if I could, I'd like to turn to you, Catherine, first to kick us off and ask how feminist and post-colonial IR can come together to address the global nuclear order. Thank you, Julia. And uh, thanks also to the Chatham House and International Affairs team um, for publishing our special section and for organising today's event. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I too would also like to acknowledge my co-author and co-editor, Shine Choi, who can't be with us today, but whose input has been absolutely crucial to the special section, to our introductory essay, and also to the wider research network, Feminism uh, and Nuclear Weapons Research Network, from, of which this special section is a product. So Shine and I started that network, and we also start our introduction uh, in puzzlement at the lack 
of uh, sustained feminist engagement in our field of feminist international relations with recent developments in nuclear politics. And we were also frustrated at the fact that when nuclear issues are, are rarely touched upon, um, the few reference points are still generally very narrow, basically literature and uh, movements from 1980s Cold War feminist context in the UK and US. Um, the special section is thus a collective effort to revitalize feminist IR scholarship on the global nuclear order and its discontents in ways that take fuller account of the, of the colonial matrix of power, as we call it, and its contemporary realignments. The special section also expands feminist IR work on nuclear politics empirically, both in terms of uh, a greater diversity of geopolitical contexts from Sweden to Pacific Islands and much more, and to a longer stretch of time um, from the 1940s and the dawn of the nuclear age right through to the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So in our introduction, one of the things Shine and I do is reflect upon what distinctive insights uh, into global nuclear politics can be generated by a feminist approach that takes colonialism and its ongoing impact seriously. And we draw on very diverse work, actually not just uh, post-colonial work in IR, but also uh, indigenous studies, uh, critical uh, area studies, literary studies, um, in order to explore how gendered identities, gendered power relations, and gendered symbolic systems have intersected with the legacies of colonialism and their racialized underpinnings to shape global nuclear politics in important ways. I'll limit myself, uh, so I'm very short of time, to just two main points about this. And I'm gonna illustrate those points with very brief references to the, um, some, the work of some of our special section authors who aren't going to be speaking today, but who, who I know are in the audience, so I hope we'll hear from them that way. So one argument that Shine and I make and that you'll find in the wider special section is that a feminist slash post-colonial slash decolonial lens reframes nuclear politics debates from the rather abstract terms in which they're usually conducted in the mainstream as an ethical question about potential destructiveness or in rationalistic terms of state choices. Instead, our approach centers our attention on ongoing embodied and highly unequal lived experiences of the global nuclear order. So most obviously, our approach in the special section brings into sharp relief the ongoing impact of nuclear technologies on many mostly indigenous communities around the world made possible not only because of their physical distance from centers of power, but also because of their feminized and racialized status as inferior peoples. And these communities live with irreparably harmful consequences of the nuclear order, one gendered dimension of which is the damage caused by ionizing radiation to women's reproductive systems and hence to their children. Uh, and relatedly, uh, women in these communities are often at the forefront of opposition to the nuclear order, although that's not necessarily always widely recognized. This is shown in our special section by an important article by Rebecca Hogue and Anais Moro. Uh, one of the things that Hogue and Moro demonstrate is how the movement for a nuclear free and independent Pacific was underpinned by the often unacknowledged work of women activists. And they also show how these women's uh, poetry centers the lived experiences of the communities of which they were part. That's just very brief touching on, on that uh, first argument. Moving on to the second argument, I want to underline how a feminist slash post-colonial decolonial lens also helps us to unpack the discursive mechanisms through which the global nuclear order is legitimized. I'm sure we'll be hearing some more about that from our other presenters. So in that regard, Carol Cohn's 1987 analysis of the techno-strategic discourse of nuclear elites is very well known, um, and I'm sure is known to many of the audience to this webinar. So Cohn showed how nuclear weapons were discussed in terms that reproduced gendered binary, 
uh, in, in terms of a symbolic system, whereby nuclear weapons are coded in masculine terms as denoting strength, rationality and control. Um, and in this system, the emotional and embodied impacts of nuclear weapons are uh, denoted as feminine and thus rendered unspeakable within mainstream discourse. Um, the articles in the special section show how Cohn's discourse should, uh, sorry, show how Cohn's article should not be treated as universal, um, but should instead um, be seen as specific to a particular time and place. Um, because we have several articles that show how this works differently in different contexts and is interwoven with racialized and colonial ideologies. Several pieces in the collection, notably those by uh, Hevatala Taha on Egyptian popular culture in the 40s and 50s, and by Emma Rosengren on uh, Swedish nuclear renunciation in the 1960s, actually loosen the association of masculinity with nuclearism and femininity with disarmament. Uh, the former by showing how nuclear technologies were represented in feminine coded terms as a beautiful woman or an egg, and the latter by showing how the Swedish disarmament position was ultimately coded in masculine and technocratic terms. So there's some, com some complexities here that we need to pay more attention to. Uh, the contribution by Laura Rose Brown and Laura Considine is also important here. They give us a detailed unpacking of gender discourse around the non-proliferation treaty. Uh, they show how uh, gender has been equated with women who are in turn positioned outside the NPT and equated with disarmament, all of which marginalizes the women already involved, fails to interrogate the role of men and masculinity, and serves to entrench the nuclear status quo. So that's, that's an interesting application of a discursive analysis to an international uh, institution, which hasn't um, yet received uh, much attention in the literature. I think it extends Cohn's, um, Cohn's contribution in really interesting ways. So basically, those are just two main arguments that I'm gonna throw at you on what a feminist slash post-colonial, decolonial approach can show us about global nuclear politics, the kind of direction that it might um, lead us in. I'm sure the other contributors here will pick up on some of these themes, uh, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Catherine. There's, there's so much to unpack there and all the, I can't believe this is all addressed in one special section, but hopefully we can start to um, get into some of the case studies now with the other authors as well and um, address some of those um, questions in the Q&A. Um, could I turn to you now, Lorraine, to ask about your research and ask what we might miss in an analysis of nuclearism or nuclear crises when we ignore the role played by masculinity? Right. Thank you, Julia, and thanks to Chatham House for sponsoring this important discussion. Also, much gratitude to editors Catherine Ashley and Shine Choi for all their work and spearheading this effort. So my piece is entitled Masculinity in the Cuban Missile Crisis, Gender as a Preemptive Deterrent. And it's a comparative gender analysis of the three leaders in the missile crisis. As a political scientist, I'm a Latin Americanist, a Cuban specialist who focuses on insurrection, war, and militarization. And I'm working on a book on the missile crisis that incorporates the Cuban perspective and experience drawing on feminist post-colonial theory. The, the familiar representation of Fidel Castro during the crisis revolves often around his mental health and his emotional volatility, casting him almost inevitably as the hothead of the Cold War, irrational, possibly mad, and thus ultimately the true danger in the crisis. Khrushchev too is represented as erratic, though ultimately rational in stepping back from the nuclear brink. But in the US-centric scholarship on the crisis, as well as popular representations, masculinity is often a means of conveying the erratic, menacing nature of both Castro and Khrushchev. By contrast, Kennedy is represented as this cool-headed, deliberate, rational actor during the crisis, which is what saved the world from the nuclear brink that Khrushchev had rashly pushed us towards, and Castro, if he had his way, would have pushed us over. I mean, that's the dominant narrative. But post-colonial theory instructs us to be suspicious, first of all, of where the story begins. 
um, what is the first of all of the narrative so that we question which leaders or nations are included as actors and also which are ignored. And it also instructs us to be alert to certain tropes embedded in colonialist representations of colonies, namely that they are childlike, irrational, emotionally volatile, and thus incapable of self-governance or nuclear stewardship in this case. So I reset the beginning of the narrative in my project um, and in this article, taking into account how Cuba represents the crisis and taking into consideration the consistent US aggression against Castro-led Cuba from the economic embargo to assassination attempts, and of course, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Examining the Kennedy administration from this longer run per perspective challenges the cool headed rational image of Kennedy who pursued Castro in what many thought seemed to be a, an obsessive manner, one that didn't make any sense to many, even in his own administration and to US allies. So this comes across, and it came across to me very clearly in the primary documents, as well as later interviews and memoirs by even veterans of the Kennedy administration, which sometimes contain these very frank assessments of Kennedy as obsessed with Castro, an obsession that often explain, is often explained in terms of masculinity. That is, Castro threatened Kennedy's sense of masculinity. Just as one example, presidential advisor William Bundy later characterized Kennedy's efforts to oust Castro as a competition in machismo. So returning to the comparison of all three leaders, each had a pronounced masculine performance of toughness, courage, and strength, which really got under the skin of the other side. And so the path that led to the nuclear showdown had more to do with a series of masculine one-upmanship, I'm suggesting, than the literature has acknowledged. And this invites us to set aside a mythology of Kennedy's rational cool-headedness for a franker assessment of the role of masculinity and emotionally infused decision-making that often had more to do with leaders' self-interest than national interest, self-interest in the sense of representing oneself as masculine. Um, the flip side of this dynamic is that all three leaders consistently self-represented as calm and, and rational, making tough decisions in an emo unemotional manner while representing the other side as the gendered opposite to that ideal. So this realization can act as a check on leaders' decision-making in a crisis, um, in future crises. And veterans of the missile crisis on the US side, most famously Robert McNamara, later recognized the importance of understanding the other side's perspective. So the research here on gender can help avoid misunderstandings of intent and ideally can invite reassessment or reconsideration. In terms of crisis resolution, I also argue that the concern to appear manly operated as a preemptive deterrent against decisions and actions associated with femininity, discouraging not only signs of weakness and cowardice, but also diplomacy and cooperation. So I'll end there and I look forward to hearing from others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doreen. I, I, your article was fascinating reading about sort of all the quotes that you've pulled that invoke this masculinity and some of it was very eerily similar to today, uh, similar situations we're, we're going through now. Um, so thank you so much for that. And could I turn to you to talk about how, how indigenous women have asserted their self-determination in opposition to the nuclear fuel chain? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Julia. Thank you to, um, the audience, Chatham House, and of course to Catherine and Shine for uh, getting this, this enabled, and of course to the co-panelists. Um, as, um, uh, as noted earlier, my article in the special issue uh, is entitled Indigenous Women's Resistances at the Start and the End of the Nuclear Fuel Chain. It is a part of a larger study on contesting disposability along the nuclear fuel chain from uranium mining to nuclear power and weapons production and testing to nuclear waste dumping, most occurring on indigenous territories and thus dubbed nuclear colonialism. This work and the larger work of which it is a part considers how nuclear colonialism and nuclearism more generally is gendered in ideology and discourses legal and regulatory regimes and material effects. In this examination, I draw from indigenous feminist analyses of the colonizing and gendered nature of uranium mining 
and extractive industries more generally, particularly in North America and as manifested from Canada's Northwest on the land of the Dene uh, to the American Southwest on the lands of the Dene that can simil similarly apply to nuclear waste dumping, particularly in Canada. It extends my earlier work on the case of proposed permanent nuclear waste dumping in the form of sterile experimental and unrealized deep geological repositories or DGRs in the Great Lakes region of Canada, which has become a significant nuclear hotspot and where the world's largest operational nuclear power plant is located. In that earlier work, I explored the relationship between gendered settler colonialism in Canada and the, nuclear, and the nuclear colonialism there for which it paved the way, and the early failures of settler anti-EGR movements to understand this relationship and their complicity in it, militating against solidarity with a First Nation resisting DGRs on its territory. That nation is the Saguin Ojibwe Nation, or the San, which is part of the Anishinaabe people. And as this current piece highlights, has now successfully stopped the siting of one DGR on their territory by a sound referendum, as Canada is now requiring consent for the siting of DGRs by indigenous nations beyond settler municipalities. This particular piece is framed in terms of what settler feminist and feminist IR scholarship on anti-nuclear politics can learn from interventions made by indigenous feminist thought and indigenous women's practices to challenge the nuclear fuel chain, specifically at the beginning and the end of it, upon which nuclear weapons and power depend. It argues that a better understanding of the gender dimensions of uranium mining and nuclear waste burial reveal how the raw materials for nuclear production and the disposal of the waste it generates were and continue to be made possible, not only by the denial or deflection of indigenous people's sovereignty over their lands, as enshrined in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, or UNDRIP, but also indigenous women's political and cultural authority and bodily autonomy to exercise their own responsibilities for producing just relations. The latter are not recognized by UNDRIP, or more recently, the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or the TPNW, but are key, I argue, to more thoroughgoing indigenous sovereignty to resist both settler and nuclear colonialism. In light of such findings that indigenous men and women bear different costs from uranium mining, with, for example, male miners suffering terrible working conditions and early death, but, but so-called uranium widows bearing the brunt of such losses on top of also being contaminated in their homes and by their water and food as they, uh, they provide to their families, while also being at risk to reproductive failures and harms, as well as gender and sexual-based violence characteristic man camp mining projects, which are also a characteristic of the digging of DGRs to contain the even more toxic end product a process and spent uranium. I suggest that non-indigenous feminist critiques of nuclear politics should direct more attention to the need to strengthen both indigenous sovereignty and indigenous women's self-determination. Indigenous feminist scholarship has chronicled the unique anti-colonial resistances that indigenous women have mounted against the imposition of heteropatriarchal relations within indigenous cultures by extractive industries, and the particular harms uh, of them to women's reproductive, social reproductive and cultural responsibilities for reproducing just relations among humans and with a non-human world. Such scholarship has also identified what has been variously called resurgent or rematriation practices that reassert both collective indigenous sovereignty and indigenous women's authority to protect their nations, their own bodies, and the natural world uh, that, are, that is a part of it. In the case of the San in southwestern Ontario, water walking is among those practices women have revived and extended both to reclaim their nation's lands and waters and to strengthen their nation's resolve to withhold consent in the face of enormous financial pressures and cultural appropriation attempts by the nuclear industry that built uh, the largest nuclear plant on their land 
without their consent for further nuclear colonialism in the form of proposed low and intermediate and high level BGRs on their territory. This practice is also increasing among other Anishinaabe women in Northern Ontario, also under threat of a proposed high level BGR near previous uranium mining sites. To the degree that indigenous and indigenous women's sovereignty assertions are supported within and outside their nations, the production of nuclear materials could be sorely compromised by a cessation of uranium mining and nuclear waste disposal on indigenous lands on which current and future nuclear installations rely, including so-called and so far imaginary small modular reactors. At the same time, non-indigenous feminist anti-nuclear scholarship within and outside IR needs to direct more attention to how strengthening indigenous women's self-determination can help prevent the disposal of nuclear waste from the dismantling of nuclear weapons and power on indigenous lands, which could be a potential result of the TPNW and further shifts to renewable energy. This has further implications for how to deal with such waste through feminist, anti-colonial, and social and environmental justice lenses. Thank you, I'll end it there. Thank you so much, Anne, that was, that was fascinating. And I think it really sort of highlights the costs of, of what happens when you ignore the coloniality of power in understanding the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, can I turn to Anan now? Um, to, to ask how, how can we go past the binary divisions of sort of the West and the non-West in addressing nuclearism? Thank you, Julia. Thank you uh, to Chatter Mouse. Thank you to Catherine and Shine Shark, the editors. And, so, uh, and all the co-panelists. So my uh, topic uh, is uh, the title of the article is uh, Feminism and Gandhi, Imagining Alternatives Beyond Indian Nuclearism. So, uh, 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 for essentially, the nuclearism is the notion that nuclear weapons as well as power are essential for the defense of national security as well as national interests. As an ideological as well as discursive system, it serves to justify, legitimize, and normalize all aspects of nuclear production. Uh, and uh, specifically in the Indian context, this actually translates to an ethic uh, which results in the expansion of nuclear weapons as well as nuclear power plants. And then in this context, I show how an alternative ethic to that underpinning nuclearism can be built around the themes of intersubjective selfhood, emotions, as well as civic ahimsa or nonviolence, on which feminist thought as well as Gandhian thought uh, converge actually. And so, uh, like as it's evident from my attempt, it's actually a potential attempt to create a global IR, uh, to add to the global IR tradition, hopefully to have maybe even global conversations or even plural, pluriversal conversations within the realm of normative theory. And uh, it uh, possibly tries to, you know, uh, show the diffusion of critical IR theorizing between the East and the West. And, uh, uh, and even the notion between, as we were talking, the notion between the division between the East and the West, even uh, that needs to be critically interrogated because Gandhian theory, for instance, is, has been influenced significantly by a lot of Western influences, for example, the Bible or Tolstoy, and even the feminist canon, which has been developed, of course, it owes a lot to the, a lot of circular South Asian intellectual traditions, as well as, you know, uh, experiences, uh, experiences uh, at the grassroots level from a lot of unnamed feminists fighting, uh, you know, uh, at the forefront against the uh, likes of Kudam Kula nuclear plant, Jaitapur power plant, etc. And uh, so the implications of such a conversation, such a potential conversation would be that, you know, it could result in a better effective disaster scripting. Um, so uh, drawing from Sri Rappa Rai, I argue that it needs to create an effective politics of horror as well as anger. And uh, such, unfortunately, so disaster scripting actually refers to the modality in which how you create uh, the narrative of a nuclear disaster, especially in the Indian context and who's coined from Monami Bhatta. And, uh, and, uh, such an ethic could actually potentially enable as well as amplify the resonance of the experiences of the marginalized people, including the women who have suffered from the expansion of nuclear power plants as well as weapons. And also, it could also be integral to the construction of a counter hegemonic response because uh, nuclearism is actually integral to the ambivalent post colonial racialized as well as gendered identity of India, which privileges a masculine development model. And only the degree varies. And of course, uh, under earlier governments, it, it used to be pretty ambivalent. The nuclear, uh, the, and now, especially with the rise of Hindutva and uh, you know the, the RSS-led politics, it's much more embraced and is uh, resulting in you know 
uh, unprecedented expansion of nuclear weapons. And so it could actually potentially challenge, uh, offer a counter hegemonic response in this aspect. So in that sense, it could be one of the implications. And the last thing, the implication could actually legitimize non-exploitative forms of, uh, you know, science and techno science, because uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, and uh, India is currently in a scenario where the politics of no nuclear knowledge is actually skewed in favor of the hard science of nuclear scientists and technocrats, which unfortunately enjoys widespread legitimacy. And so, so hopefully such an ethos, such an ethos that I'm proposing which seeks to uh, induce a relational self emotions as non-violence, such an ethos would imply a shift from the present top-down approach of development to one that ensures the broad-based democratic participation of disadvantaged groups, which results in a radically democratic ethic of uh, you know decision making. And uh, guided by the intensive deliberative approach of civic ahimsa, such dialogues between scientists and nuclear and local people could actually result in potentially pluralistic, feminized, and non-exploitative uh, forms of science. And uh, in this, so these are the you know the normative, maybe the pathways which I seek to open in the realm of nuclear ethics, which maybe could aid the movement of India to a post-nuclear future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anand. That was fascinating. Um... Yeah, I, I just remind everyone to pop your questions in the Q and A in the Q and A box down below, and also Isabel is very kindly posting links to all the articles. So if you haven't read any of them yet, in the special section, you can you can click on them and read them later. Um, but thank you so much for all those introductory remarks. I think we have we have a lot to get to. I think in this Q and A section. Um, but if I could, I'd like to start with a question for the, for the whole panel, really, um, while some more questions filter in. And perhaps I'll go to you, Catherine, to answer it first. If and then any other panelists, if you'd like to reflect on the same question, you can just jump in. But I, I'd like to know how how would you like to see sort of the findings of this special section being translated into the work of policymakers, sort of more generally, especially in light of the upcoming non-proliferation treaty review conference and in light of the first meeting of state parties of the um, TPNW. I'm sure the other panelists as well will have things to say about that. But um, for me personally, um, I mean, I would make a defense of the importance of the special section in its own terms, actually, and not just in terms of its policy relevance. And that I think there are uh, arguments here about how the nuclear order works and how it uh, has been challenged historically and how we might challenge it more effectively and holistically um, that are of interest to a wide range of audiences, academic, specialists, non-specialists. Um, I would also uh, have, I always try to argue in these kinds of contexts that um, it's not just policy makers that I'm interested in talking to or that the I think the special section as a whole talks to but um, to uh, citizens activists more broadly defined so I this is uh, very much kind of uh, a politicized uh, intervention that we're trying to make um, but yeah it's not just I would resist its containment just in a kind of narrow policy box is what I'm trying to say <laughs> having said that I do think there are arguments here and, and our authors do a great job at the uh, usually in the concluding section of each of their papers trying to draw out the implications for policy I think uh, sort of speaking generally across the articles I think that has to do with um, the attentiveness to how power relations under, are underpinning uh, global nuclear politics. It's about re-embedding nuclear discourses in kind of social and cultural formations, not seeing them as kind of free floating neutral arguments, but recognizing that they have a history, that they come from a particular place, that they are reflecting and entrenching particular power relations. And also that those power relations are highly complex and intersecting, um, and that we need to look at how they play out in different ways in, in different contexts. Um, yeah, so I'd also, I think, want to uh, insist, um, well, as far as I can, that uh, policy making discussions need to pay attention to 
the feminist and decolonial struggles that have already, you know, that are already going on out there. None of what we're saying actually is new. It has long roots. We're drawing, we're very indebted to longer histories of, of critique and of struggle here. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's a whole kind of rich diversity of voices out there. Uh, which which policymakers are listening to, particularly in the context of the TPNW negotiations, but I'd like to see them uh, reaching a wider audience. Thank you so much, Catherine. Would anyone else like to, to jump in on that question? Anne? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would just add um, beyond uh, social and historical relations, re-embedding nuclear politics in those is also re-embedding nuclear politics in the material and, uh, and, and in what ways, as much as we may, um, you know, as much as the TPNW uh, constitutes in advance, um, I think uh, thinking through uh, the process of what do we do with all the nuclear material already out there and particularly, um, it, and nuclear weapons is only a start on that, um, is is uh, is is the you know is remains a hugely open question and uh, so I uh, I think uh, again you know how are you going to put this genie back in the bottle well on whose land are you going to do this and 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 how much toxic material is out there not only in the form of um, of uh, uranium on process but um, all of the tons and tons and tons you know of waste that's uh, already there. So, um, so I think this is really another huge question um, and uh, one that, uh, that um, you know, particularly impacts indigenous peoples, but it, we're, we're talking about you know, the planet as well. Thank you so much. Um, if I could, I'm gonna ask a few questions from our audience now. And the first one is from John Paul Rosario. And if I could ask this to you, Lorraine, about what specific parallels do you see between President Kennedy's comportment during the Cuban Missile Crisis and President Biden's with the ongoing crisis in Ukraine, or is it too early to make an assessment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I was revising this article in the midst of the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine. And so that was on my mind to a certain extent. Um, I think that some of the, one of the lessons that I see the a gendered post-colonial analysis of, the, of Ukraine um, offering, you know, is that there's a certain dynamic uh, in the debates going on about um, some people arguing that, uh, Putin should be allowed a, an escape hatch to, to you know, pull out of Ukraine with some of his, his uh, dignity or, or a good part of his dignity intact. Um, and then the response to that has often been, oh, you know, screw Putin's feelings. Uh, we should crush him basically. And uh, there's, the research pushes me to be just, attentive to the extent to which this is a lot of what I'm calling this masculine comeuppance, you know, that might be directed towards Putin, that neglects um, kind of certain posturing um, on NATO or the U.S. perspective as well. Um, the, the, the missile crisis really exemplifies how much leaders seem to care about, or at least in that instance, how much they cared about how others perceived them in terms of their masculinity. And part of this, so their decisions were driven by how that those decisions would be perceived in terms of strength and toughness um, and courage. And part of that is because they wanted to remain in power, of course, but it was also kind of an end in and of itself, you know, that the leaders themselves cared about how their own legacy would, would uh, end up um, in the history books. And so I think that keeping in mind how that might operate in this Ukrainian context as well. With regards to Biden specifically, I think he's certainly part of this dynamic. I would love to um, have something akin to the Kennedy tape transcripts where we get to see all the conversations that went on um, 
with regards to Ukraine. I, I, I don't think that, I don't know if that'll ever happen again, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, lots of questions are coming in, so that's great. Keep them coming. Um, the next question I'd like to, to pose to you, Anand, um, and it's from Pfizer Fareed. And they ask, in urban India and Pakistan, owing to a rise in nationalism on both sides, women become the sites of ideologies and narratives. Women in the peripheries are ignored altogether. Broadly speaking, can we envision a future that involves both India and Pakistan women working for a better eco-friendly future? Can I give that question to you, Anand, please? So uh, there was a, in the wake of the 1998 test, for instance, there was a, uh, you know, a moment in which uh, people, especially from the urban communities, uh, actually came together. From I think there was a South Asia collective in which that such a moment actually happened, in which people from the urban centers actually came together, uh, protesting against these policies. But unfortunately, at the moment, it looks such a future definitely looks very bleak because of various factors. Because on the one hand, uh, you know, the elites, uh, uh, so uh, we only have, you know, certain surveys in this respect, which point to the fact that the propensity to that this notion of nuclearism or the propensity to view Pakistan or India through a, you know, nuclear lens is very much predominant. And, you know, um, most of the respondents actually subscribe that, you know, nuclear weapons are absolutely essential. And of course, uh, and then I think there should be more studies. Uh, some of them in our department are actually considering more studies to be held. And there's a think tank culture in which a lot of military experts, they cannot, they cannot, you know, conceive an the lens beyond this, beyond viewing Pakistan or you know India, uh, beyond, at least I can vouch for India. It's it's hard to view you know you know uh, mention a lens beyond such uh, such a maybe pop nuclear lens. So the prospects look uh, you know increasingly difficult. And another aspect is that the experience of marginalized women they are not actually brought to the fore. So it's very so since uh, you know my based on mine and a lot of friends who are actually working on these areas that experience think tanks. They can't actually, it's very difficult. The uh, nuclearism is so pervasive that you cannot actually, it's almost similar to what Karen Cohen has mentioned. It's very similar to what's happening in, here in India. So you can't actually mention these experiences you will be looked down upon or, you know, these are not even considered very important. So I think the first step would be to ensure that these voices, like you were mentioned in the question, the marginalized, you know, the voices of those people that as perspectives from the peripheries are being heard and, if, and they should be amplified as much as possible. I think that is the first step. Uh, I mean, often people are not, when I was talking about the people uh, recently I was invited after the the you know the publication of this uh, and I was talking about the experience of people in Meghalaya and Jadukur, and most of them hadn't even heard of the experience of the marginalized women in the peripheries like you were talking about and so I think such a panel such these discussions would be the first step at least towards raising awareness of the right because the, the situation is that bad and nuclearism is so often you know assume the position of common sense so it is a long 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 struggle so that's definitely what I think of the situation. Thank you, Anand. Um, the, the next question I have is, um, what do we lose by, and I think I'll go to, sorry, I should have said this before. I think I'll go to Catherine and Anne if you both like to answer this question, but what do we lose, Emma Saunders asks, my colleague here at Chatham House, what do we lose by just looking at either feminism or post-colonialism in nuclear politics? Are the two inextricably linked? And if so, could you please elaborate how? Um, Anne, if I could turn to you first, if you if you want to answer this question, and then Catherine as well. Well, I think that the, those connections have to be made um, quite visible. I, I think through particular through a decolonial feminist lens, that is, uh, you know, to put those two things together um, in um, you know in clear form. And um, so I think, as I also indicate in my own piece, um, looking at the feminist literature earlier feminist literature on nuclear politics, much of it heavily focused on nuclear weapons, but, um, but certainly also uh, nuclear energy. I noticed another question about that. Um, and I think that remains an area, uh, you know, largely unexplored in feminist IR more generally. And um, so I think what we lose in, in only looking through a feminist lens, particularly an earlier feminist lens prior to more intersectional thinking, more decolonial thinking, um, that uh, you know that we lose the understanding of um, the particular harms um, visited upon um, uh, women of color, indigenous women, et cetera, et cetera, from 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 nuclear processes in, in very non-spectacular, quotidian, and um, ongoing ways uh, that are short of you know nuclear explosion. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so I think that it, it's that 
interconnection that's being made uh, that has advanced uh, thinking uh, since uh, Cold War scholarship uh, on feminist nuclear uh, thought. And so uh, I think what we what we gained, right, is that interconnection. Thank you, Anne. Catherine, can I turn to you? Yeah, that was um, very eloquent that uh, as Anne just expressed it, I, I agree with all of that. I think, um, well, to be frank, when we started this project, I did uh, the, the bringing together of feminism and post-colonial approaches was, was and remains a kind of central um, plank of what we're trying to do. What I have come to realize as the project has developed is that there it's overly simplistic to see them as entirely distinct domains. And that actually what we need to do is think about uh, where historically they may have overlapped. There have been many decolonial feminists, post-colonial feminists over the years, including those working on nuclear politics, whose voices just haven't been heard within IR or beyond IR. Um, not only the uh, indigenous uh, activists that Anne is talking about, but I'm also thinking about scholars um, such as Runa Das, Teresa, Tiawa, and we try and do some work in the introduction, kind of pulling those voices more center stage. But it is nonetheless true that certainly within the field of international relations, feminism as it has kind of emerged as a distinct and self-conscious project was relatively detached from post-colonial thinking and post-colonial thinking as it has emerged as a self-conscious project is relatively marginalized feminist concerns around gender. So there have always been people that have crossed the two. Also, I think uh, what I've become increasingly aware of is uh, that it's, it's not just post-colonial thinking, which is a distinctive uh, tradition, but also decolonial thinking, which has slightly different political and ideological intellectual roots. Um, indigenous studies, um, yeah, literary studies and ethnic and uh, racial studies, um, critical area studies. These There are voices in all of these different domains, which might not necessarily define themselves as feminist or define themselves as post-colonial, there might be a different terminology that's used, but we can draw on the insights that they yield about the kind of intersecting ways in which power relations are shaping global nuclear politics and people's daily lives um, and bring them into feminist IR. So I suppose that's a very long-winded way of saying that feminist IR needs to have this post-colonial and decolonial element within it um, it doesn't always have that, it hasn't always had that. We need to kind of recenter, in my view, that's actually part of the, the second part of our introductory essay that Shine and I write, uh, argues that we need to kind of, uh, that actually focusing on global nuclear politics helps us think about feminism differently and brings colonial, colonial power relations and racialized power relations absolutely center stage into how you think about feminism and that we need yeah, we need to do more of that. And that needs to be central to feminist work on nuclear politics moving forward. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, Lorraine, do you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, thank you. And then those were great comments. I just want to briefly add, you know, one way to that the two are important um, in terms of their interaction is through just discursive analysis and and um, it looking at the way, looking through a post-colonial lens at how nations, certain nations are represented as worth study and others are part of the periphery that can be safely ignored. Um, the, study, the study of masculinity or including masculinity in the analysis can um, help kind of fine tune our understanding of how these international power dynamics are sustained such that, um, for example, in the case of, of nuclear energy or nuclear weapons, you know, what are the safe countries and what are the, you know, who are the safe nuclear stewards and who are the unreliable ones? It's gender analysis isn't only about comparing masculinity and femininity or the contrast between the two, but there's distinctions to be made 
within masculinity such that there are kind of those um, valued forms of masculinity and, and then the devalued ones. And so on the one hand, you have rational, civilized um, nations that can make good judgments on behalf of the global nuclear order. And then, and that's a certain version of masculinity that's valued and contrasted with its gendered opposite masculine of, of volatile, um, emotion-based, aggressive forms of masculinity. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, the next question I have is for Anand from Katie McCann, who asks, is the kind of nuclearism being seen in India unique, or is it also evident in other countries? If you'd like to reflect on that, Anand. Uh, nuclearism uh, the, is definitely not unique, and uh, I've actually used this from various, uh, you know, uh, I actually borrowed this from the studies of Nick Ritchie with respect to the UK, uh, as uh, well as, uh, you know, uh, several examples in which it's uh, considered almost very national. But I think the, uh, again, like uh, the panelists were saying, the combination of both the post-colonial and the uh, feminist approaches in the, in the sense that the, uh, you know, the, the particular combination of a racialized and, uh, you know, a gendered response. But in India, uh, what uh, specifically happened was that as a response to the, the British project, which was actually a, com a combination of a both a ma masculine project as well as a techno-scientific project, this was the Indian response in which, uh, you know, th this had to, you had to impose, uh, you, you had to fight it back through masculine forms of techno-science, actually. So that's, in a sense, that's essential to the identity of India, that such a, and then, of course, the threat of Pakistan that makes it, you know, racial, the Islamic other that makes it racialized as well. So such a unique configuration of a racialized and gendered identity, I think you don't, that's almost idiosyncratic, I would say, you know, you don't, that, maybe that's a particular combination of, uh, of, of, maybe a particular combination from a post-colonial moment. So in that sense, I think it's it's a very, you know, unique in that aspect. But def definitely, nuclearism is definitely it's pervasive across the world, and I just wanted to adapt it for the Indian context in my study. Thank you, Anand. Um, as I see, we've only got a few minutes left. I'm gonna, there's two questions here um, for the panel. And so whoever would like to ask them, please just jump in. But I'm gonna ask the first one from Amrit Swali at Chatham House here first. Um, she asks, what does the panel think is the role for truth and reconciliation processes when it comes to trying to address or redress the impact of nuclear testing? So is there anyone on the panel who would like to answer that question? Maybe Anne? Uh, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, nuclear testing and other forms of nuclear colonialism would, would be a part of that remit. And uh, I mean, we, we certainly do have an example of uh, Canada's truth and reconciliation process, and which has been heavily focused on, uh, in particular, uh, the experience of, um, of Indigenous peoples with residential schools. That was you know, sort of the primary um, uh, process there, but also addresses questions of economic development and the uh, uh, and begins the uh, along with UNDRIP so its codification of um, indigenous peoples' rights to uh, resist harmful development on their lands. You know, going forward, uh, the problem, of course, is the legacies of of not only um, you know of of this kind of development, nuclear development in particular. Uh, but uh, legacies too of, of uh, all kinds of, um, of violences to indigenous peoples through residential schools and, and uh, you know, cultural um, destruction. I mean, it's just the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the laundry list is long. Uh, but, um, but what is, of course, interesting is that at least in that particular process, that nuclear does not appear at all um, in the documents of the, of the uh, reconciliation process. And uh, while I, I think it creates a space for uh, interpreting, for expanding uh, into, uh, expanding into that area, it just is not named. It's not visible. So, um, so one can hope that going forward, if these, uh, if these processes become, you know, remain living documents that can be added to and developed, that that's one way to go. But of course, there's another uh, concern that Indigenous peoples have about truth and reconciliation processes is that they can be. Uh, in, to, in terms of just you know encouraging a, pro, a politics of recognition, do not necessarily change the uh, the colonial conditions under which um, in which uh, their uh, lives are are organized. And um, 
Uh, so it's going to take a lot more than those processes to, um, you know, to gain, um, you know, nation to nation sovereignty. I think is going to be uh, it will be the next step. Thank you, Anne. Um, and we have one last question, which I might try to squeeze in in the last few minutes, um, which asks: Besides nuclear weapons, how about nuclear energy? A lot of countries need nuclear energy. Do you think that is due to masculinity as well? Or is there a real need for it? Do you think nuclear energy should be treated different from nuclear weapons? Um, is there anyone who would like to answer this question? Catherine, perhaps? Can I turn to you first? Yes, I could dive in. Um, I, I would argue that that need is socially constructed, politically constructed, and uh, several of the contributions in our special section would, would give rise to serious doubt about whether it's the way forward, um, particularly in the light of the kind of communities that Anne's been talking about, and also the other work on Pacific Islands where people uh, are extremely concerned that, um, you know, the, the uh, climate crisis is uh, offering another way in which to legitimize nuclear energy. We, we have, well, another point I would make is that it's not just about masculinity. You know, Lorraine has been very clear about how uh, we must see masculinity as um, plural and as intersected with other forms of power. So we need to think about how um, the demand for nuclear energy might be being generated by these kind of complex gendered formulations, which aren't just about gender, but also other things as well. Um, and what role gender might be playing in legitimizing that. The, the final point I wanted to make is that nuclear weapons and nuclear energy are integral, integrally linked. They're part of the same system. The nuclear fuel chain that Anne's talking about is linked to the production of nuclear weapons. The waste uh, um, that Anne is talking about is generated by nuclear weapons production as well as by nuclear energy. Um, and also ideologically uh, within the non-proliferation treaty system, um, uh, the, uh, the, the peaceful plank of nuclear energy is part of what legitimizes the status quo in terms of nuclear weapons possession. So, uh, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone in this panel, but I think, um, or for everyone in the special section, but I think most of us would, would probably uh, want to contest uh, the, the idea that, the, that nuclear energy is part of the solution to our current energy crisis. Thank you so much, Catherine. And as I say goodbye to everyone, I'd like to encourage you to quickly click on those links to all the articles in the special section if you haven't done so already. And if you haven't already read the articles, because it truly is an excellent special section. And I think the research and, and all of your case studies and findings are coming at a critical time. So I would thank you all for your work and your research in this area. And thank you for being here at Chatham House today. Um, and we hope that we can welcome you back soon. And Isabel's just put it in the last link for read the whole section here. So there you go. You will have the links now. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining today. And I wish you a lovely day, evening, wherever you may be. Bye, everyone.